So I guess because I've talked to you a couple of times and you're an intelligent man, I have to start with what the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> what what yeah. are you doing this for? No, it's a, it's a great question. And the, and the issue is most people don't know this, but for me to do this, this is really an establishment person's game, right? Either you, you have, or, or wealthy, either one, establishment or wealthy. Yeah. So the other people who are running against me, the Democrat and Republican, they are both literally career politicians. So they are taking money from the people and running a campaign. I'm not, <laughs> right? I'm a consultant. If I'm in front of you, I'm not in front of clients. So I'm just losing money. And I've been doing this for a year. I lost over 50% of my income last year and I will lose over 75% of my income this year doing this. I have a wife who doesn't work, two kids. I live in New York City. Oh you, my gosh. You can imagine my bills. Yes. So why would I do this? It's a great question. And there's a very simple answer. I don't want to move. My state is broken. And I was actually considering moving. For what I do as a consultant for business, I need a big city around me somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of leaving. So I actually went down to North Carolina, Charlotte. I was looking at Charlotte, big city in the South. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, great place to go. And it was amazing. I could sell my house in Queens and buy a mansion in North Carolina and pay less taxes and be freer and just everything good, a major airport. Oh my God, it's amazing. So I got angry. Why isn't my state this good? And it isn't, and it should be. My state should be this good, and it's not. So I have two choices. One, accept status quo, which is not my way, or change it. So I'm running. And I'm punishing myself. I am. <laughs> but I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I knew what I was doing when I got into this. Yeah. Right? I knew what I was doing. I just want more people to understand what I'm doing so that we can make real change. That's the issue. I will tell you that I used to live in New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple things I noticed. One, I'm a kind of guy that is always, I grew up in small towns, mm -hmm. always lived in smaller areas. I'm a kind of guy, I see garbage, I pick it up and I put it in the trash can. Oh, Until that, that I moved yeah. into New York. <laughs> that doesn't work. And within a year, I yeah. found myself saying, and it, it stunned me, why the hell isn't the city cleaning this mess up? And I stopped after that came out of my mouth and I thought, I've been here too long. I'm now expecting the city or the state to do something yes, about you are. this. That is correct. It's horrible. Yes. Yes, but New York City is able to survive for a reason that people don't really understand. New York City is the largest city in the entire country by more than double, right? By more than, it's massive. It's, it's larger than 40 states. That's how big New York City is. It's massive. But something else people don't realize. One third of people who live in New York City aren't born in the country. Another third aren't born in New York City. It is literally a magnet for talent. Mm -hmm. So because you have so much opportunity, because you have so much talent in New York, it's a magnet for talent mm -hmm. from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's a 16 million person metro area. So tons and tons of, of customers and clients mm -hmm. and, and people to hire. Oh my God, it's massive. It can be a communist state and still survive yeah. because the opportunity is so huge. Yeah. Now take that outside of New York City can't have those same rules because you don't have that same environment. I don't know if you can have those same. Uh, I moved my com company mm -hmm. because, you know, they were just taxing us to death. Absolutely. It to, I wanted to build a radio studio. Mm -hmm. It took me a year. I came down here. You've walked around these studios. Mm -hmm. Pretty massive. Absolutely. 80,000 square feet. Yes. I turned this into digital radio and television Within a week. Yes. Impossible in New York City. Impossible. In New York State. Yeah. Impossible. Can it be done? Yes. That, it can it be done. So the goal is to make sure that the establishment constantly wins. That's the issue, right? We, we will always do it. In New York State, one thing we're really good at, two things. One is pushing out anything new, right? Pushing out it so we can make sure the establishment old money stays. We love old money in New York State, right? Anything new, we push out. We push out, we push out uh, hemp, cannabis, uh, vaping, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, anything new, gone. Cannot be in New York State. We can't stand it. Old money, we keep. But something else to do really well is we pretend we're doing it to protect you. So it's always in the guise of safety. I care about you. Our, our current king will always say, my number one issue is protecting New Yorkers. And that's not the number one issue. In reality, executives take the same oath I took as a Marine. And that is to, to serve and defend, to protect and defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. It is not to protect every individual citizen. 
I was a Marine. That wasn't my job. It wasn't to protect every individual citizen, nor is it the president's job or governor's job or mayor's job. That's mm-hmm. not your job. What's supposed to happen, it doesn't happen, but what's supposed to happen is the executive branch with all of its soldiers or police force defend the constitution and defend the individual's rights, the mm-hmm. constitution, then we defend ourselves. Mm-hmm. We're nowhere near that. Remember in America, it's very rare that the government just takes our rights. Almost always, we vote them away because of fear. I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that, I'm afraid of him, I'm afraid of her. Please take my rights. Make me safe, take my rights. And New York State is a great example of that. We do that constantly. I'm afraid, vote it away. So tell me about, because you do live in two different worlds. Mm-hmm. Um, I have my uh, children's uh, family up in upstate New York, mm-hmm. um, Rochester. I was living in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. It is night and day different. Yes. Night and day different. Absolutely. So how does a state work when you've got Manhattan and mm-hmm. it's crazy laws and yep. crazy views and it has all the population to vote that way and you're out in the middle of really nowhere in, in New York, five hours away. Yep. You have nothing to do with the city. And you have to live under those laws. Two issues to remember. The first thing is the idea that New York City outvotes New York State is a myth that's perpetuated so that people don't vote and it's working. Hmm. In reality, as I mentioned, one third of New York people who live in New York City aren't born in a country. One third aren't born in New York City. Most can't vote. Hmm. The actual data out of New York City, only about 1.5 million New Yorkers out of New York City people actually vote. They can be outvoted. But the problem is everyone believes they can't. So we have a 70% of, of New Yorkers don't bother voting, most from upstate. Because upstate believes what you just said. Mm. Why bother? New mm. York City is going to outvote us because they have eight and a half million people. Yeah, but only one and a half million actually vote. Big difference. So the reality of it is, that's not actually accurate. But the number one thing that you mentioned is how do you make that happen? People often say, well, what's the big difference between right and left or Democrat and Republican? It's not ideology. Look, you and I all have to remember, if you look at a, for example, a Carter Democrat, a Clinton Democrat, an Obama Democrat. They're different Democrats. Mm -hmm. Look at a Reagan Republican, a Bush Republican, and a Trump Republican, different Republicans. Ideology shift. Mm -hmm. There's one constant that's lacking, respect. That's the issue. The issue isn't ideology. It's just respect. I've said many times, people ask me all the time, Larry, what's libertarian? And I say the same thing every time. Libertarian says, you can be as conservative or as liberal as you wanna be, Just don't force yourself on others. And government also equals force. That's the same thing. Just don't force it. If you just respect people, then all of a sudden you can live with them. We we, we used to. Yes. We used to. That's correct. So Rochester and New York City are different. I get it. They are. My running mate's from Rochester. Mm -hmm. So I I get it. Absolutely. They're they're different. You know, he he likes to hunt, Mm -hmm. right? He, He likes to go out and camp. That's his thing. He's a Western New Yorker. Many Western New Yorkers love that. Most New York City people don't. Right. And that's not good or bad. That's just who you are. I'm, I don't hide I'm a city boy. I speak too fast. So there's, mm-hmm. there's no way I can hide I'm a city boy. I'm a city mm-hmm. boy. I'm born in Manhattan, raised in the Bronx. I, I get it. I'm a city boy. And I'm, and I'm happy and proud of that. But I can also respect other people. And I think the funny thing, I think I learned this most. And people ask me why I'm this way and how so many others aren't. I think it was the Marine Corps. When I joined the Marines at 17, I had never really met people who weren't kind of city folk and New York folk. And I found that so many men that I respected, that I loved, that I would have literally died for, or I would have died with. Mm -hmm. Many of them were what I would consider them country bumpkins, but they were good men. I respected them. We didn't, you know, we didn't know. uh, I remember one of my friends said, he used to ride a motorcycle with flip flops on. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was the most craziest thing in the world, right? He would have, he'd tell me, I have right. no helmet and flip-flops riding a motorcycle. I thought, that's insane. Who would do that? <laughs> right. There should be a law. There should be a that. law. Why, well, of course, why would you do that? Yes, that's what I thought. But then I realized, no, he's just a guy who enjoys that stuff. And good for him. I wouldn't do it, but so what? Right? So what? He's not, he's not going to play stickball in the street either. So how, how do you get this message through... Uh, the gauntlet of the media, yep. the gauntlet of the parties, mm-hmm. the gauntlet of everybody being churned out in universities. Yep. Um, this is, it's 
a Silicon Valley idea of mm-hmm. do it your way. Yes. You know what I mean? The, but it yes. doesn't connect with people for some reason. But I think it does. And here's what I mean by this. Look, just people tease me and they say, well, Larry, you know, you sometimes spend too much time with the left or too much time with the right, right? Whoever, if you're left, you think I spend too much time with the right. If you're right, you think I spend mm-hmm. too much time with the left. And I say, hey, who's going to fix this? Who's going to cross that barrier? Mm-hmm. If you're left or right, you can't. You have to be a mediator. Someone who is, is far less concerned about feeling righteous and more concerned about the results at the end of the day. And that's gotta be a business guy, right? Because that's what I'm concerned about. At the end of the day, if I have happy customers, I win. If I don't, I lose. As and governor, your customers are the citizens. That's correct. As governor, New Yorkers are my customers. Mm-hmm. If they're happy, they stay in New York. If they're happy, they grow their families. And they, they don't leave and go to Texas to, to build something. They build yeah. it in New York. Right. They hire people in New York. They retire in New York. They spend their pensions in New York. They do all those things. And that's what I want. And that's how I see it. So how do I get through that? Is by getting people to hear that. Because that's a universal message. People wanting to be happy and not move is a universal message. Everyone wants that. We just can't get it. But I'm saying you can get it. This is a universal message. My issue is people aren't hearing it. So what am I doing? I'm using non-traditional media. I'm using, I'm not only using podcasts and Facebook. You know, I have an event with over 100 people, 200 people in an event. And I will literally say this. All right, guys, who here came here because you saw my commercial on TV, my TV commercial? <laughs> no one's hands go up because I don't mm-hmm. have any. Right. Somehow I can fill a room more than either of the two major parties without having a TV commercial. It's we're living in a time, and this has happened to me several times, where I'll see a crowd someplace Mm -hmm. and I'll say, who's over there? You would think that it was a name that everybody knew. It's a nobody that is huge to a group of people just online. It's niche media. It's niche media. I use niche media all the time. Right. Literally, I go on things like I'll go on, literally, the vaping legion, right? Mm -hmm. Which Mm -hmm. is literally just for vapors. And people think, why would you do that? Because if you're a member of niche media and the vast majority of people under 40 are, and many over 40 are also, but the vast majority under 40 are part of some niche media. If you take the time and energy to download this podcast or go on YouTube and watch the, the daily output of whatever it is, you care. You care about that thing. Well, if I'm on there and these guys go, Larry Sharp's a good guy, you listen. It's what you do. So I figured this out. And niche media wants more people who are mainstream because they're not mainstream, they're niche media. Mm-hmm. So I can now cross over that line. I do it often. I go on many podcasts and I go on the most niche podcast possible. doesn't matter. I do it because that's how I'm getting through. And I'm breaking through, as I, as I might have mentioned to you, you know, I'm polling at 13%. 13% is insane, right? This was two weeks ago. With, For a libertarian, especially. Yes, with about one third about two weeks ago with about one third of name recognition. If I get my name recognition up to 100%, multiply by three, right, it's 100%, that's 39%. 39% in a five-way race in New York State is a win. win. 30% is a win. 39% is a blowout. So it is possible to happen. The issue is, will people see my name? That's how I get out. I get out by doing two things. One, niche media, not stopping. Literally, as I told you, I don't work anymore. I do two, three, four events every day. Every day. I do media events. I do media events while I'm in the car. While I'm in the car driving from city to city, I'll get online and I'll, and I'll literally get on a phone call and I'll take an interview while I'm in a car. I'll answer Facebook while I'm in the car because I'm driving from one event to the other. This is a full-time job that you can only do if you are either wealthy or you're part of the establishment. I'm neither, so I punish myself, which is fine. I accept that because my hope is no matter what happens, in the long run, others see this and they copy. I, look, I'm the kind of guy who models the behavior that I want from others. So I'm modeling that behavior. I hope others will follow. All right, I want to get into some of the, some of the ideas that you have because I think they're trem- <clears throat> tremendous and we have to start thinking um, out of the box. But I, I have to... Because we've had this conversation off the air, not you and I, but a couple of my coworkers and I, we've, we've had this conversation off the air. If I'm living in New York, Mm -hmm. I know the Republican is not going to win. That's correct. And uh, so it's going to be Cuomo. And I can't imagine why I would vote for a Republican, uh, even if I like the Republican, uh, and wouldn't send a really strong message 
you know, by voting for you. This is what I say all the time when people don't understand. Democrats, too. Look, most Democrats don't like Cuomo. All right, how do we know this? An actor got 35% of the vote. Mm. I have anything against the Nixon. Uh, I'm sure she's a fine woman, but she was an actor. It's not like she came up and had sure. massive ideas sure. or experience. She was just someone who said, I'm not Cuomo. And she so, got 35% of the vote. So they don't like him either. What I'm trying to put out here is a vote for a third party, any third party. I prefer mine, obviously. I'm biased. Right. But any third party, once you have a third party, particularly libertarians, who will often tip, dip their toes in left and right, depending upon the issue, are the referees. You will actually have better Democrats and better Republicans if a libertarian's in the room. Mm-hmm. Because when a Republican says Democrats are evil, no one hears it. When a Democrat says Republicans are evil, no one hears it. When a libertarian says, hey, Democrats, aren't you supposed to be about civil liberties? Why aren't you? People hear it. Hey, Republican, you're supposed to be about smaller government, less taxes. Why aren't you? Now people hear it. Mm-hmm. So that beca- there's the referee. If you want a better Democratic Party and a better Republican Party, you should be voting libertarian. That's the way to make it happen. Otherwise, nothing changes. In my state for 16 years, Republicans have not won any statewide election. Uh, governor, senator, uh, uh, AG, lieutenant governor, nothing in 16 years. Yet somehow the establishment still lies to its people and says, this is the year, guys. This is the year. It's shameful. It's, if I was a Republican, I'd be, embar- I'd be angry. I'd be angry because for 16 years, Democrats have run the state. If they were going to fix it, they would have fixed it. Republicans have watched this for 16 years. The question I always ask, where's their plan? Where's their movement? Right? People bug me all the time. They say, well, Larry, where were you five years ago? Where were you three years ago? I wasn't working in government. I was a private citizen. I was fixing my business and my family from a crash in 2009 that devastated me. That was my, my job was fixing my family and my business. And I did my job. I did my job. Their job, literally career politicians, was to make sure our state doesn't fall into a death spiral and we don't have a million uh, people leaving in the last eight years. They failed. I'm running because they suck. That's why I'm running. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, in one year, I have a movement and plans. They have nothing. Let's get to some of those plans because they're some of the best, well thought out, out of the box. I've not heard these before. Mm-hmm. Let's take uh, infrastructure. Sure. Absolutely. One of the biggest issues we have all the time is how do we repair infrastructure? If you are a Democrat, you will hear the phrase fund. If you're a Republican, you'll hear the phrase invest. I'm sorry, the word invest and the, and the, and the word fund. What those means, over your taxes. So they mean more of your taxes. And what I'm saying is, why are we doing that? Why are we constantly throwing the same money into a bad system? We have bridges and tunnels right now that still collapse in New York State. That's horrible. All right, several ways we handle this. I'll give you three separate ways that we can work. One is just in general infrastructure. We can actually do it to where we lease naming rights to infrastructure. New York State has massive infrastructure, bridges, tunnels, the Erie Canal, massive infrastructure throughout the entire state, right? Tons. Why in the world do we have right now, we have a Mario Cuomo Bridge, which is a bridge named after our our imperial family. It's it's, it's horrible. So we have that right now. That should be the, the Apple Bridge, the Staple Bridge, the Verizon Bridge, right? So we lease the naming rights out to the bridge. Why would they do this? Well, we already have, uh, they already name uh, stadiums. They do it already. They drop $20 million a year for a stadium that's used on the weekends. They would easily drop 50 or or $100 million for a bridge. That is mentioned hundreds of times every single day during rush hour mm-hmm. in a 16 million person metro area. And hundreds of thousands of cars pass it every single day. Mm-hmm. Of course they'd pay for that. But as part of that, we also want them to take care of maintenance. Now, people, of course, go, but then, you know, they won't care and the bridges will collapse. Okay, bridges collapse now. <laughs> now they collapse. <laughs> like, 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 pe- yes. like, like somebody who could lose their entire company if it collapses yes. wouldn't care. But a government that is faceless, nameless, yep. they care for that's some correct. reason? Well, next thing, though, is, is since we still own the asset, we still inspect it. So inspections still happen. So as the inspection happens, currently the inspection happens and it goes on a long list of what we'll fix whenever we get to it and the bridge collapses. But in this case, it goes, oh, inspection, great. Staples, fix the bridge in six months or you lose the contract. (gasps) The bridge gets fixed. We actually have safer bridges. But the best part about having safer bridges is we don't pay for it. I just lowered spending. And on top of that, if there's less government money going out, there's less corruption. So if you just lowered corruption, lowered spending, safer bridges, Huh, not a bad deal. But here's the best part. 
If they're paying for this, why should we have tolls? And you've lived in New York. You know how bad those tolls are. Mm -hmm. Some bridges, 15 bucks to cross. Mm -hmm. And if you're a trucker like I used to be, you pay per axle. Every axle you're paying 15 bucks. Changes everything. But that's, I'm, I'm done with that. In, in this one that I'm talking about now is just the MTA, meaning just downstate. The MTA has massive rail lines, right? It goes out to Long Island, upstate, all over. Why aren't these rail lines being used at night for freight? They're not being used at all right now. Passengers aren't, aren't going around at two o'clock in the morning, right? So why isn't freight coming in? Freight lines come in. Why would they do that? Okay, number one, it's cheaper than trucks. Number two, less wear and tear in the city, less truck traffic in Manhattan, right? No more 18 wheelers running into Manhattan. Bring, bring them that way, right? And they have to come at night anyway. They come it's at all, night anyway. Yeah. Exactly right. So instead, bring them on this instead. Of course, it's, the, it's their, their stuff, so they'll pay for maintenance on the rails, which passengers use during the day. Yet again, they will pay for it. We have a system like this already. We basically do this for airports, right? The airports, they kind of, they rent out their gates. Mm -hmm. We have the system already. I'm not making these things mm -hmm. up out of nowhere. It's, it already exists. Same idea here. Again, raising money, raising money, raising money. And fixing our infrastructure and safer. We have derailments already in Amtrak. But now if they have to pay for it, again, we still own the asset. We only lease up naming rights. But I'm still not done. Now, now straight up state. Erie Canal. Erie Canal has give or take 520 some odd miles, about 30, I think 33, 34 different locks. Right now, the Erie Canal costs us about $100 million every year, including capital projects. We make less than 5 million. Oh my God. Yeah, that's nothing but a big loss. How about instead, we give out naming rights to all the locks. It's the McDonald's lock, the Taco Bell lock, the Burger King lock, and, oh, you know what? Maybe McDonald's wants them all. Billion dollars, take them all, right? You have all of them, I don't care, whatever the number is. Great, they can all become tourist traps. I mean, tourist sites. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, at that point, we make that happen, and we rebuilt the entire Erie Canal, and we make it viable. But I'm gonna do something else. Right now, the Erie Canal does one thing very well. It smells. Really good at that, but that's about it. But I wanna actually put, I wanna put hovercraft on it. And I mean hovercraft for a very specific reason, because hovercraft's really cool. And cool hovercraft would bring youth back to our state because someone's got to figure out how to put it on the Erie Canal. Someone's got to figure out how it works in the locks. Look, when I was in the Marine Corps 30 years ago, we had hovercraft that could take a tank across the ocean. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's something cool now. I don't know what that technology is. I don't care what it is. I know it's amazing. We'll put it on the Erie Canal. And someone will want to slap the name on the side of a, of a, of a hovercraft. And we'll raise more money. We'll raise money, make things exciting, better life. We build our infrastructure out, but I'm still not done. There's one more left. Someone asked me, there's an inter interstate upstate I-81. And someone said, it's collapsing, Larry. How are you going to fund it? And I said, I'm not. I said, what? I said, I'm not going to fund it. So what are you talking about? It's, it's, it's destroyed. Great. My answer is Google Road. There's always space on the sides of all these interstates. Put a Google Road down the middle of it or on the side of it, whatever's the appropriate thing to do. Or one of those, those uh, magnet rails, one of those things, put that down, right? So what company X wants to build one, great. Put it between, I don't know, between uh, Rochester and Syracuse. There's your road, your Google road, put it up. Here's your, your rent. Your rent to keep that road is maintenance on the interstate. So now you have two choices. You can use the interstate if you want to, or drive the cool Google road of the case may be. You get both. More options, more choices. We don't pay any extra cash. And since we're still inspecting it, if they want to keep the Google road, they have to maintain the road. So we get road maintenance. Again, everybody wins. And what happens? We get more people with more choices and less taxes. We have to push spending down. People always say, Larry, you don't talk about lowering taxes much. I don't. I talk far more about lowering spending so that I can push surpluses to the individual counties. So the counties themselves can become heroes. And there's a reason why I want that. There's two reasons. Reason number one, when I take over, I'm going to have people against me. That's how it works. I know that. I've done this in business before, right? I go into a business and I'm a new business and I'm a guy mm -hmm. who's an outsider and they think, who's this guy? One of the ways you do that is to make the local managers heroes, right? Mm -hmm. Then they begin to support you. Same concept in government. I will now allow the local people to be the ones who decide on tax cuts. I'm the guy allowing them to start putting task cut bills together. They put their name on it. I sign it, you, yeah, all you, yes, you are amazing. I will sign that in the heartbeats. Your, your name's on it, not mine. You will see I'm giving you an opportunity to be a hero. Less chance you fight me. Less chance you fight me. But more important, I don't know what taxes are hurting every individual. I don't live in, there's 62 counties in New York State. I don't know all of them. I know what's killing me in Queens, 
But I don't know what's killing you in Rochester or Ontario County or wherever you are. I don't know. So how about your local people tell me? And let them do whatever they want. I'm about reducing spending. We do that. Now we can lower taxes locally. I've not heard a politician talk like this before. Um, And I'm trying to think of uh, how it could be done. Mm -hmm. And you make total sense. And it could be done if it wasn't. And especially in New York, the labor unions alone Mm -hmm. would crucify you. No, I disagree. And here's why. Two things. One, I'm actually pro-union. Union, unions are in the First Amendment. They are freedom of speech plus freedom of assembly. It's what they are. I'm mm-hmm. a problem. But at the same time, what makes things better is the Janus decision. The Janus decision says what I think is right, which is you shouldn't be forced to be part of a union. Mm-hmm. Right? When you're forced to be part of a union and unions have basically codified power, mm-hmm. right? then of course they're going to stop things. But they're not anymore. Now they can do what they should do. The problem right now with unions is the current union, you ask any union worker, they will agree with me every single time. Unions spend 90% of their time dealing with 10% of their bad apples. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't be doing that. Mm-hmm. They should be spending 9% of their time helping out the 90% of amazing union workers there are. The average union worker just wants to make a living, right? There's mm-hmm. 10% that are really bad guys. 90% are just average guys and gals trying to mm-hmm. make a living. So if they would spend time on that, they will be much better. And that will happen because Janice will allow people to have more than one union. And when that begins to happen, you'll see better unions. But here's the most important piece. All of my... Plans, particularly for teachers, corrections officers, law enforcement, they actually love it. The unions hate it because Mm -hmm. it's Mm anti-establishment. But I'm actually making a better world for the actual worker. My education plan focuses heavily on allowing administrators to be relieved and allowing for teachers to actually teach. I have not met one teacher, and I've met dozens upon dozens of teachers when I cross this state who all, all go, this is amazing, I love it. Explain, explain that. Explain the, the education sure. part of your plan. The first thing is getting rid of all standardized testing, right, until high school. We did it on purpose so it allows, look, standardized testing is unfair to teachers. There's not f- fair way of grading them. It's unfair to schools for rewarding them. But on top of that, it makes kids who are little kids who can't test well feel stupid. It creates a second class student at 10, 11, 12 years old, right? And it's no indication of success in the future. So it not, only hurts. When that happens, teachers will go, oh, my God, I don't have to teach the test anymore. No, you teach to your normal localized test, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade. Teach them how to read and write. Teach them how to think. Teach them how to love education. Teach them how to read, to enjoy reading. Do what you do best. We have massive teacher burnout here right now in New York State. Massive. And the reason is so much checkbox, 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 and not helping the student. And the minister is hanging over them. Right now, currently, his majesty... King Andrew II, um, he actually, he, his plan for teachers is, and this is true, get non-teachers to teach actual teachers how to teach better. That's his current plan. Yes. Wow. I'm, yeah. I'm saying let teachers just teach. If someone's going to fix it, it's going to be them, right? But I want to really allow for more localized control. Someone actually asked me, let me go to my funding real fast. Right now, funding of the, of the actual um, of the education plan right now is very convoluted. It is a mixed way of an algorithm that decides test mm-hmm. scores versus this and all of that. Instead, flat dollars per student, here's your check, done. In the current system in New York State, if you don't spend your money, you lose it. How stupid is that? Yep. Wow, that's dumb. Yep. The fact that it exists is embarrassing. I don't, mm-hmm. want, I don't want to say that out loud. It's mm-hmm. so stupid. How about I said, here's your money, and if you don't spend it, oh, you could save it. Huh, look mm-hmm. at that. You could actually save it. Not just that, you don't have to write grants to the state so that I decide when you get a football field. And of course, I decide because my buddy happens to make football fields. Mm-hmm. So, and he gave me $40,000 mm-hmm. for my campaign. So what a coincidence, you now need a football field. Right. And now state money goes to do that. How about instead, save your money, you have it ongoing, and if you need to get a loan, you'll be able to, because again, guaranteed government money, banks love that. 
You could even take a loan if you wanted to, to, to build your football field. Here's the issue. I don't know when you need a football field. You do. So why should I be deciding if, if and when you need one? I've had people say, Larry, we need a farm in, in our high school. And I go, okay. Need a what? A farm. Okay. And I say, okay. I actually had a woman call, call in once. She said, Larry, you have a problem. This is a radio show. And I said, what? She says, I'm dealing with kids coming in this year and they're four and five-year-olds and we have a problem because they don't know anything. They don't know their numbers. They don't know their colors. They don't know any of this stuff. They don't know anything. And I said, wow, what do you think the answer is? And she said, I'm going to pay the parents. I'm going to pay them 50 or a hundred bucks. If their kid passes the test, it'll encourage them to train their kids and teach them before they come to school. And I thought to myself, wow, what a terrible idea. Hmm. That's what I thought. What I told her was, you know, when I'm governor, if your district says you should do it, you should do it. And the reason why I said that was I practice what I preach, right? I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. She deals with the kids every day. She deals with the parents every day. Mm-hmm. If her teachers and her administrators all agree, good, good idea, try it. And mm-hmm. what happens? Either I'm right and it's a bad idea mm-hmm. and we all see it and go, don't do that. Because if she's thinking that others are too, mm-hmm. right? She isn't the only one thinking this idea. So she will have proven them right or wrong. But what if I'm wrong? And this is an amazing idea. And all the kids come in better. And I had another teacher tell me, she said, Larry, there may be some merit. I said, why? She said, you don't know how much money we spend on remedial education. That we might act- it might actually be cheaper to pay the parents than to spend all the extra money and time on remedial education. I thought, that's why I said yes. Because you know something I don't, I don't know. know. How would I possibly know that I'm not a teacher? Mm-hmm. That's exactly my, my whole plan is that, in a nutshell, for almost everything. So I'll go even further. In addition, when that happens, when I actually go back to removing all of the testing, we'll lose federal funds. We'll lose about $4 billion in federal funds. So when we lose that money, we also lose all of the strings attached, which means all those administrators can go away. Administrators get about $150,000 or more per year. Teachers get about $80,000 per year. So for every two administrators I, I lose, it's four teachers I can hire or give raises or buy more computers or whatever the case may be. I'm providing a surplus to the district by default right? Which is great. Because again, the guy who won't decide how to spend that is me. They'll decide. Only thing I require is transparency. If they're transparent, everyone can see it. Life is good. If you take government money, we need to see where it goes, period. No exceptions in that rule. If you don't take government money, good luck. Do what you need to do. But if you take government money, we all see what happens. We have to go even further. I don't want K through 12 anymore. I want K through 10. The last two years of high school, and again, I'm saying things that people know to be true, but no politician says it. All they say is, we have to invest in our kids and fund our kids <laughs> and care about teachers and care about students and education is everything. Education is not everything. We have a thing in New York State called the Regents Diploma. You may know what that is. Uh, it's a Regents Diploma. It's a special diploma that comes out of high school. It is 100% useless, totally and absolutely worthless. No one will say it. I will. It means nothing. How do I know that? I hire and fire. No one cares. You got a special high school diploma. No one ever. This has never happened. Oh, Mr. Beck, Regents diploma. I had no <laughs> idea. You're hired. That's <laughs> never happened ever. Nobody cares. It's a bunch of more, it's more administrators, more testing, more, more stress. And we literally have kids. We have an epidemic of suicides in kids now. Why would we be doing this? We have bullying issues. We have violence in schools. We're going to add this pressure. This makes no sense whatsoever. The last two years of high school are a bunch of lost kids. Lost. They're doing video games, gym, study hall, smoking weed, bad habits. Then they go off to college. It's 13th grade for the first year because no one's ready for it. And then it takes six years to graduate high school. Bad, bad, bad. Nothing but bad. It's only, and if they even graduate. You mean college. College. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If they even graduate college because the graduation rates are as low as they've been forever. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. So instead, at 16, Take your test. If you pass your test, you now have a high school diploma. Done. Whether that's homeschool, private school, public school, don't care. Take a test. You're good. You have five options now. One, if you think college is the right answer for you, which for some people it absolutely is, no worries. Go to a prep school, go to college. We have to stop people from believing that the only answer is college. It simply Mm -hmm. isn't. Mm -hmm. Education is not the answer for everyone. And if you look at what's happening now, again, I'm a guy in a business where I see this. We're actually looking at smaller companies. If you have a master's degree or above, you're a no hire. Mm -hmm. You are literally a no hire. Oh, master's degree? No, thank you. So what are you finding? You're finding highly educated people in government because government still 
cares about that and still pays you for that. And some large organizations do and academia does, mm -hmm. right? So you find people in academia, government and large businesses. Small businesses, you have a master's degree above, they're saying, what did you do? What have you done? Yeah. So they care yeah, You about. know, it's not so small business. Google and Apple yes. is now saying that. It's correct. They don't want that degree. Does it matter? I've, I, I've never in probably 400 jobs that we've created, never have I once said, uh, so what'd you uh, get your degree in? Yeah, yes. Uh, could I see your certificates? Yes. I, I don't care. Nobody cares. Show and, me what you've done. And we're still, we're still acting like education is back in the industrial age. It's not anymore. That's why I say 10th grade and either go to a prep school and a specialized school. Is that for, is that for biology? Is it for English? Is it for history? Do that. Mm -hmm. So when you get to college, you can take advantage of incubators. You can take advantage of internships. And that's what matters in college. What you learn in college is useless because five years from now, it doesn't matter anymore. Right. Whatever you've learned is gone now. So I need, you to, I need you to want to know how to do things. That's what matters. Why people struggle to get jobs now, right? Have to, look, I've taught at the graduate level as a guest instructor at both Yale and Columbia, right? My degree, bachelor's in anthropology. <laughs> yes. I, I How'd mean, that work out for you? Yeah, great, I guess. <laughs> so, but my point is who cares, right? right? So let's give them that opportunity. But say you don't, say you're that smart kid, that brilliant kid, take the SAT at 16, Go get an associate's degree right now. Go do it. Why would you be bored in school and get bullied by the, right. by the other kids? Go off. You're going to be a scientist anyway. Go. You're that kid. Or go to an actual trade school. In New York State, we need tradesmen desperately. In fact, across the country, mm -hmm. we need tradesmen mm -hmm. across the country. But particularly in New York State. New York State, the average tradesman is over 50. It's a problem. Go to trade school. Become an HVAC person. You don't need people who are in the trades have told me, Larry, I would expand. I physically can't find the bodies. I can't find qualified people. I would expand. I, ca I can't find people in New York State to grow my business it's impossible. I have the work and I can't do it. All the time. You don't wanna go to trade school? Go to work, get a job. Uh, uh, why we're afraid of putting our kids wor working at 16, I don't know. I worked at 16. Kids that get caught in a loom, that's yeah. not how it works. <laughs> that's been gone for 100 years already, right. we're fine. They're gonna die in that kind of, you know, it's not gonna happen, it's crazy. I lost my kid in a tragic loom <laughs> exactly, accident. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, it was the bobbin pin factory. Right. And, so yes, no, it's, that's not gonna happen anymore. So let them go work, let them get a work ethic. The second thing I hear all the time, people hire me, they say, Larry, I will hire anybody with a work ethic. They don't care if they have 10 years experience, five or six, just when I say show up at eight, be there at eight. I can't remember who I was talking to. I was talking to a business owner and he said, honest to God, if I could get away with never hiring another American citizen, I would do it. I know, and that's horrible. Horrible. I wish that wasn't true, but you're not the only person to say that. I've heard that many times. Many times I've heard that, more than once. They're trying to get people because, look, I can't change parenting but I can change the environment. And I want kids at 16 making decisions now. People say, but Larry, they're 16. George so Washington much. went and surveyed. He surveyed yes. what's now Pittsburgh at 16. That's correct, yes. Why aren't we doing this? Right. Work at 16. Look, the price for failure at 16 is very low. The price for failure at 26, so much higher. That's what's happening now. We have a generation of kids now in their 20s who if you ask them, do you feel like an adult? Over half will say no. It's never happened before. That has to change. I'll start it here. Start doing it. Let me go to the next piece. How do you pay for this idea of prep schools and, and trade mm -hmm. schools and, SA, and, 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 and associate's degrees? Very simple. New York State says I have to pay for all school grades one through 12. Okay. So when I was a Marine, I got out, I got the GI Bill. The GI Bill said you have X number of dollars and X number of years to use it. How about this? We take $20,000, seven years to use it. Good luck. That sits, you know, in the government, we'll pay. We'll write the check if you, if you want, we'll write the check. Here's what I know will happen. You have a bunch of prep schools, trade schools will pop up and they'll all cost $20,000 for two years. What a coincidence. Because that's government money. And how do I know they'll come up? Because they'll get loans. Why? Banks love guaranteed government money. They will give out loans for that in a heartbeat. They'll begin to grow. But the best part about that is you will have, imagine as an 11th grade teacher, everyone in your, in your class wants to be there. No disciplinary problems, mm -hmm. no bad kid in the back of the room. Everybody wants to be there. It will change what it is to be a teacher in 11th and 12th grade completely. 
and to be a student. It'll change. It'll give you, there's no bullying in those classes, right? Mm -hmm. They're all the same kind of guy, all the same kind of gal. They're looking for the same things. I'm creating community, which is what we're lacking, right? This goes directly to school violence. School violence. All the shootings we've had, while they are murders, at their core, they are public suicides. That's what they are. The three things killing our kids, and I've said it many times, and I'll keep saying it until someone actually says this, because no one else is saying it. Lack of community, lack of purpose, and loneliness. That's why we have incels. That's why we have you know, the, the bad guys going out there and killing people. That's why we have it, because of that. Give kids purpose, give kids community. They won't be lonely. They won't kill people. That's the actual, that's the root cause of all of this. Happiness. You'll have happier teachers, happier kids, which means happier parents. Everybody wins with this, but it's the best part. We're doing $20,000 for two years. So it's $10,000 per kid per year. Right now, New York State spends $22,000 per kid per year, more even than California. 10,000 mm. more than the average, and we rank 37th in the country. And His Majesty's happy about this. Shame mm. on him. Now we're saving $12,000 per year. There's about 400,000 11th and 12th graders. That's over $4 billion. I have saved all of my federal funds. I lose nothing. And I'm able to still give every single district a surplus. Districts get a surplus, teachers are happy, administration is, is less, happier kids, happier parents, happier teachers, win, 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 and more effective. To do that, they'll have to get rid of the Board of Regents. The Board of Regents in New York State is gonna stop all of it. They yeah, have to go away. But then who would give the Regents diploma? Oh my God, you're right. <laughs> I've changed my mind. See, it all yes. falls apart That's in the end. That's what happens when that thing, I hadn't thought of that. Um, so yes. So let, let, me, let me go back to the three things that you said is the root of the problem. Give them, give them again. Lack of community, lack of purpose, and loneliness. Okay. Can you take that back a step? Mm -hmm. What has hurt the, the, the feeling of community um, and, and brought us loneliness? And what is, so what's many, caused oh these things? So many things. I, th there's so many of them. Um, it's technology is affecting us more than anything. I mean, that affects people, very many people will say, you know, Larry, I'm worried about, you know, the foreigner coming to take my job. I'm worried about um, the big business guy coming to take my job. I'd be worried more about technology than anything else. Mm -hmm. That's coming to take our job. That's the biggest thing, right? I'm worried about- um, Stop, stop. Mm -hmm. Expand on that. Yeah. All right. Let me do a couple things on this one. This is a big deal. Mm -hmm. People often, say, people used to say, I don't care about technology because it gets rid of the, 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 the chump job, the job that's unimportant, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one that goes away. But if you know what's happening in New York right now, you see a whole bunch of bankers getting laid off. Lots of them getting laid off. Why? AI is here to stay. AI does trades better than traders. Mm -hmm. Doesn't complain. A whole lot cheaper. Never ask for a raise. So I can hire- Don't have to pay it 15% or 20%. Not at all. You can, you can pay two or three tech people or maybe even a flat fee, mm -hmm. right? And boom, I got my traders rocking and rolling faster than anybody else happening all over the place. So now everyone gets affected by this, right? AI is the new thing, which is why in my personal business, I teach leadership, not management. The difference, management is process, right? And resources. AI does that very well. Mm -hmm. The manager is getting replaced by AI. What, the, what, what can't be done? Leading. Leading is different. Leading is communicating, motivating people. Throughout history, whatever technology you have, I'll give an example of the plow, right? When it was first came out the plow. Guy had a plow. All right, I can now farm better. So he puts a horse in a plow. Huh, horse in a plow, way better than me. But what's better than a horse in the plow? Me guiding the horse and plow, right? And every bit of technology, we've seen it happen, even with AI. AI began heavily when it came to chess. Remember the chess games when we were yep, kids? Yep, yep. We used to be able to beat the chess games, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. the chess AI was so weak that the average guy or gal mm -hmm. could actually beat it. And the chess masters always beat AI. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, forget 70s, mm -hmm. always beat it. No mm -hmm. big deal. Then all of a sudden it became, eh, maybe. Now AI almost always beats chess master. Always. So what beats AI? Only one thing, chess master plus AI. That's what beats AI. The combination, same thing. You have to know how to lead technology. That's the future. Now, the problem with that is 
No one's saying that, but guys like me, we're still saying go to college and learn stuff. We're focusing on learning things that computers learn in five seconds. Mm -hmm. We're focusing on learning things that'll be irrelevant in 10 years. What I'm saying is let the actual companies deal directly with the actual trade schools, prep schools, and they'll tell them what to teach the people. Literally, if you're sitting in New York and you own a plumbing company and there is a trade school, a plumbing trade school in your town, you are literally gonna go to them and say, do me a favor, train them in these things. That's what I need from them. Mm -hmm. If they know this, I can hire them. In mm -hmm. fact, can I take one of my guys, can my manager come in and, and teach one of your classes? And they'll be like, sure, bring them in. That's how it's supposed to work, mm -hmm. right? Not just that, I'm a tech company and I want tech guys. Don't teach them, teach them these things. The problem, and here's how I know it's true. I'm a trainer. So I teach college people who go to a company and I, the company has to pay me to teach them. <laughs> and they came out of college. Right. Because everything in college isn't helping. I literally ask people, who here has an MBA? And they'll go, me. Okay, I have to break your bad habits. Literally, I have to break their bad habits because it doesn't work in reality. How many times I've taught people that's school, not reality? That's school, not reality. So the whole thing has to change. Technology is changing all of that. Our schools haven't figured this out. And most of our average businesses have been figuring this out. And government has not figured this out at all. So that's the first piece. But there's even more. Technology changes how we communicate. It makes us completely connected. But we're connected via avatar. Mm -hmm. We're connected via the image that we portray. Mm -hmm. And we usually portray images like you and I we portray an image. But there's an emotional intelligence that you and I have right now when we're together that allows us to go, oh, is he telling the truth? Is he not? What's real? That happens because I'm actually seeing you. I'm reading your, your body language. You're interacting. But when you show up on my screen, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. The pictures you choose to show me, the images you choose to show me, it's a broken reality. So all I assume is, wow, everyone's having a good time except me. Everyone is perfectly, you know, infallible except me. Everyone looks amazing, except me. So now I project this also, how awesome I am when I realize that I'm not. So now I'm a liar. And now I feel, how do I deal with this? One of the things you see me do very often is I'm very human. And I'm purposefully very human. I've been doing this over a year. Not once have I ever brought notes to anything I've done. Mm -hmm. I, and always I do it live. And always I take any questions and no rules. And I make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, I say, I'm sorry. I'm trying to show people that I'm human. You wanna make this place a better place? Accept being human. Technology takes that away. We wanna be human. We wanna have a connection. So it hurts us there also. So there are many ways, that, but let me go one, one step further. Automation. There's a big push for the minimum wage, hmm. right? Big push minimum wage. And I get it, lot, I get it emotionally, right? I want to make more money. You should pay me my money. Feels great. Mm -hmm. I got it. But what's actually going to happen, and it's because technology is, it's going to crush small business. How do we know this? Look at any big business, any franchise, any, any large organization, they already have the tools there already. Mm -hmm. Go to a, a CVS or a Walgreens or any of those things. What do you have? Self-checkout. Are you ready? They're, they're already making sure you're prepared now for when mm -hmm. they fire all their employees. Mm -hmm. Already setting it up. They, don't they have that new, is it, it is an Amazon store now that you just mm -hmm. walk in, grab yourself mm -hmm. and walk out, mm -hmm. right? That's already happening. Look at any McDonald's or Taco Bell or mm -hmm. Burger King. They have kiosks where you can order. It's already there. Go to, go to a, a chain like a TGI Fridays or Applebee's, right? Same idea. Kiosk at the, at the uh, table already. They're prepping you for when they fire everybody. And it's working because we don't even notice. I say it and people go, oh yeah, because they weren't paying attention. I'm watching this. This is my world. I see it. The most common, this is horrible. The most common job for a male in the United States, driver. Not driver for cars. The most common job for a woman in the United States is either server or clerk. He asks. Yeah, we're being replaced. And we're worried about things that don't matter at all. So... <clears throat> Let me just spend that. Did I go too far? Did no, I no, go no. Off? Uh, no, let me, let me just, uh, this is a hot place for me um, because I can't, uh, find, people are not talking yes, about Yes, find this. a politician who always talk about what's happening in your world. Find a politician who will tell you that your kid in 11th, 12th grade is smoking weed 
and playing video games. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that. Mm -hmm. find, a, find a politician who will tell you college is not the answer for everything. Mm -hmm. And free college just makes people unhappy. I'm the one telling you this because it's real. I'm the one telling you that AI is our biggest threat. Let's fix this. Let's work on that thing. It's a big deal. Let's change education completely. I don't want to keep funding <sighs> bad systems. Well, the average politician, in, in my book, my latest book, I, I said, um, how do you know um, which politician is, is lying to you mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, just on the phrase, uh, when, when they're talking about jobs, you know they're lying to you when they say, I'll bring the jobs back. Yes. They're not coming back. They're not coming back. You have the 5, 5G network. Right now, you do need guidance mm -hmm. because of the latency problem. Mm -hmm. But you go from 100 millisecond latency to 1 millisecond latency, and all of that information is being able to go back and forth at that speed. You don't need drivers. You don't need anything anymore. But what you need at that point is curators, right? Yes. If you, right, curators. And this is the issue that I deal with all the time. This is in a sales world or business world. What is the way of making money when there is so much information you can never even deal with it all? Mm -hmm. It's curating it. Mm -hmm. It's what you do. You curate information. So we, that's where it matters. If you can curate the right information, that's where we're leading technology. Where does your plan, because I love your education plan, but in, by 2025, you're not going to have a career that lasts a lifetime. You're not going to have a career Already. that lasts half Already a lifetime. Now. The average person now will have five careers. Correct. Yes. Five, so, now five jobs have careers. You're going yes. to need to retrain. The Absolutely. First, the first out of the chute are going to be the truck drivers yep. and the drivers. They're the first gone. As soon as 5G is up, it's over. So... Um, where in your plan for education do you re do you have can you use that education at any point in your life? Of course, yes. And there's the issue: the idea that college is for someone who's 19 is also an anachronism. Also, shouldn't exist. College should be for anyone who wants to be trained at went, any time. I went to as at a third as as a 30 year old, and I can guarantee I learned more. Yes, because I cared. Yes. I wanted to learn it. I went to college late. I was in my 20s when I went to college. Yeah. When I was 17, I was a punk. Yeah. I wasn't going to learn anything. I agree completely. So whenever, here's the issue though. If you really want this to work, this is the thing I talk about more than anything else. Of all the things I talk about, people ask me once, Larry, if you could only focus on one thing, there's nothing else you could change. If you could change one thing in New York State, one thing only, I would say strong entrepreneurial class. Mm -hmm. That is everything. That's the core. If you focus on small business, what New York State does is it bribes big business to come. Other states do also, but no one's better in New York State than this. We, we will literally say things like, come on in big business. We'll give you $10 million in bribes. We'll build stuff for you. Literally, we will build it for you. Just show up. Now you're already big business. Now you have bribes. You crush all the business around you because no one can compete with you. Then five years later, the bribes go away. You leave, ghost town, mm -hmm. rinse, repeat. Rinse, repeat. That's mm -hmm. been happening for decades in New York State. Mm -hmm. I will have none of that. In fact, I think it was Amazon who wanted to come to us in New York State. We bribed them $700 million and they said no. How bad is our state that I say, hey, Glenn, here's $700 million. No, thanks. Right. How bad is that state? That's where we are right now. No, the answer is support small business, support small business. Many ways of doing it. The first one is actually are being done in Wyoming. Wyoming right now has a law that if you're a local farmer um, you are, and you only sell locally, you are immune from all federal regulatory bodies. I will copy that in New York State for all small businesses. Right? How do they get around the commerce law? Not only within the state. That's but it. That was, the, that was the, I can't remember the name of the I know. case, but that was And the, I'll see you in court. Hmm, I'm okay. I Good. will see you in court. Good for I don't you. have a problem. I will fight that Good all the way. for you. Absolutely. You changed that one decision Bingo. and everything changed. Absolutely. I will fight that all the way through. So small business, small farmers, if you don't sell outside of the state, boom. It also helps something else. It helps with the idea of those who are internet sales having advantage over those who are not internet sales. If you're internet sales, you're affected because you're going to sell outside of state for sure. Mm -hmm. But if you're not internet sales, oh, 
You're not. You can just sell locally. Also helps farm to table, all those types of things. Helps mm-hmm. all those things out. So mm-hmm. helps them tremendously. It's not enough. Second, New York State has a, a law right now, a rule right now, where you have to have um, workers comp for um, accidents that are work-related and non-work-related. Now, look, if your boss tells you to do something and you get injured, I got it, workers comp. But you want to be a knucklehead and the boss is to pay for that? No. Most states don't have that. New York shouldn't either. If you want to add that as a bonus for your people, you should be able to as an employer. I don't have a problem with you doing it if you choose, if you think that will get you better talent, please add that as a benefit if you think it's the right answer. But you shouldn't have to. Not just that, New York State has an insurance board. Most states don't have that. Our board is predatory. It literally hunts small businesses to extinction. I have people who I go to, I often go to uh, fairs. And in a fair, there only will be the boss around. So I'll say, why is only the boss here? Why? Well, I can't afford any employees. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, I have employees, but they telecommute from mm-hmm. Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Wow, how bad is this state when that's the answer? Some of them say, I have employees, but I can't bring them. Because what happens is the state literally hunts the fares to look for, for employees to see if they're, oh, no, boom, $40,000, fine. They're hunting them to extinction. I will tell you, one of the reasons I moved out of New York mm-hmm. was insurance. Yes, of course. I wanted to provide top-notch uh, um, em- employee insurance. I covered all costs, everything, not a dime. Mm-hmm. I got to be the last employer in the state before they said, we can't, we can't offer anything like this. The federal government was going to come after mm-hmm. us. The state didn't yep. want it. What are you doing? How all dare of the, you? All of the people that worked for me loved it. Of course they did. You come down to Texas, I'm still one a, a fish, you know, out of water mm-hmm. on insurance. Texas is better. But New York, how are you going to fix insurance, insurance in New York? Insurance board goes away. It's a board. The thing that New York does very well also, lots of things we do well. They're bad, but they're well. We create boards and committees and commissions. Mm -hmm. If you've paid attention to New York state politics, we've had a bunch of people go to jail recently for corruption. All of them are either on a board or a committee or an an authority. Mm -hmm. Here's how it works. His majesty doesn't want to actually get his hands dirty. So he creates boards and committees, and then he places people on those boards and committees. Those people have given him money. $800,000 he received from those people already. So he puts them on board. And that's legal. He can do that. And he says it's for being fair. What actually happens is these boards are unaccountable. They're only accountable to him only. Mm-hmm. So here's what happened. And you ask any New Yorker who's cared about their community. You go to the board and you complain. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. And they nod their heads politely. They ignore you. Mm-hmm. Because you don't matter. Mm-hmm. What matters is his mm-hmm. majesty. I need to enforce the king's will. You're in the way. These eminent domain, like, the, like always, uh, stopping people, stopping licenses, removing licenses, totally fine. They do whatever they want. That's what happens in our state. Those boards have to go away. These aren't laws. It's just boards. The problem is boards are used in my state to reward the party loyal. That's what you do. So no politician wants to get rid of them because how else do you reward the people who've given you so much money without... But otherwise you can't, you have to give them some kind of monopoly so they can use their power to, to hurt people. Otherwise, why would they give you any money? Well, guess what? I don't have a career to protect. I don't have cronies. So I don't care about these boards. They can all go away as far as I'm concerned. Every one of them, as far as I'm concerned, can just go away. Go on. I don't care. What are you going to do? I, get, I have an idea. Bring it to a local level. How about that? How about, and I say local for a very important reason. The reason why I want small business, the reason why I want local if I bribe a big business to come into your town, that big business brings their own people, their own ideas, their mm-hmm. own everything, doesn't care about the, com- the, the culture, doesn't care mm-hmm. about the history, doesn't care about the environment, doesn't matter. But if you grew your business locally, you care about your culture, your history, your environment. Mm-hmm. The odds of you making an error and screwing things up goes down. And if you do, you actually want to clean it up, you care. Not just that, you're going to care what people around you think. Why? They're your peer group. You grew up with them. You know who they are. Your kids go to school with them. You care. So the odds of you doing better are higher. Don't get me wrong. There are bad people everywhere. Sure. But the odds go up if it's local. But not just that. If you want a resilient economy, it's not one big business walks in the door. It's lots and lots of small businesses that are all growing locally. This is what we do to have a resilient economy. New York does not have that. New York has a situation where, I think it's common throughout other areas also, if you're not in a big city, 
you're either employed by the one big thing, right? The one prison or the one school or college or the one big company that's in your town, right? Or you work for a franchise. You work for a Friendly's or a McDonald's or a, some, some kind of franchise, right? Um, a Dollar General, you work for that kind of thing. Or you work for the government. You're a teacher, cop, firefighter, something like that. Or you're on the dole. You're somehow on Medicaid, Medicare, or something like that, right? Something like that. Or you struggle and you're in the black market. You're selling drugs or doing something illegal. That's not the way to have a resilient economy. And that's what we have now. We have an epidemic of... We have an ep- ep- epidemic of small farmers committing suicide in New York also. They're collapsing. So let me move, let me go back to the small business because a key aspect of the small business is treating small farmers like small businesses, and we don't. It's a critical aspect. If we do that, the small farmer then has lower insurance costs because it's as a business, not as a farm. It has lower workers' comp, again, as business, not a farm. But on top of that, you add the idea that they're a business so they can have small business loans which means you can create manufacturing on the actual farm, which is what I want. In New York State right now, we have a great beer business in New York State, craft beers Mm -hmm. all over New York State. Mm -hmm. We can copy that in many different ways. Our dairy industry, dairy industry, I think New York State, if not mistaken, is the third largest dairy producer. I think it's California, Wisconsin, New York State, if not mistaken. Right now, how it works is they're basically price takers. If the price for milk is good, they make lots of money. If it's not, they struggle. That's not a good business model. Who's going who's gonna to invest in that? No one is. And that's why they can't get loans. Of course not. I wouldn't. Nobody, you wouldn't either. Mm-hmm. But instead, you like small businesses. So what can they do? Now, each small farm, craft yogurt, craft ice cream, craft cheeses. How will mm-hmm. it work? Mm-hmm. It's already working in our beer industry. We have a culture of it. People will invest in it. That will begin to happen. Now, when that happens, these guys, if they want to sell locally, again, no federal regulatory bodies. They get big enough, they can sell out wherever they want to sell. All good if they want to. And you'll cut the regulation for, I mean, I know the Amish in Pennsylvania, you know, were arrested, I think, uh, for their cheese. Yes, not going to happen in New York State. I'm going to encourage small business. There's no tomorrow, including small farms. The advantage of a small farm thing goes back to our happiness and family, right? If you're a farm, you tend to have many kids you, compared to someone in a city, right? So say you have three, four kids. Most of your kids may not want to work on a farm. So you're going to lose your kids. They're going to go off to the city. They're going to get educated. Leave. How about this? You can build a family farm with a business on it. So kid one loves to work on the farm. Kid one is out there enjoying it, milking the cows and whatever people on farms do. I'm not a farmer. Doing the <laughs> farm thing. And the other one says, you know what I want to do? I want to be marketing for the cheese. And the other one mm-hmm. says, I want to be the operations guy to make the cheese. And now you can keep your kids on your farm too on top of it. This is nothing Federal but- regulations, I don't believe, allow you to hire your kids on farms. Is that true? Yeah. Well, that, that will not exist then yeah. in New York State. See, there we go. <laughs> that won't exist. There we go. So that's my point. I'm trying to make this change where it's much better. But even with that, I want to embrace new technology. It's the next piece to think about. I have to embrace new technology. We, we pushed out cryptocurrency. We pushed out blockchain. We, we, we pushed out hemp. I mean, hemp is amazing for farmers. Cannabis, we pushed out cannabis products. People think, well, Larry, you want cannabis because you want people to get high. Okay, to be clear, the only people who might be squarer than me and maybe Mormons, because the only drug I use is caffeine. That's it. That's the only well, thing I'm, I a, use. I'm a Mormon. So, so you're squarer than I am. <laughs> right. Okay. Yes, right. you're squarer than but I am. But I will tell you yes. this. My daughter has cerebral palsy. She has stroke. Oh, she has um, seizures all the time. Mm-hmm. Here in Texas, you cannot use cannabis. Yep. And the doctors have all said, you know, you, you, know, you might want to try cannabis. Mm-hmm. M- my daughter is so literal and straight as an arrow, mm-hmm. she will not do it because it's against the law. Yep. And what am I supposed to do as a dad? What do we do? You're, Take her someplace where she can. That's the answer. Move. And I don't want you to move. I don't want New Yorkers to move. The issue with cannabis is several fold. Number one, it helps out farmers. Again, hemp is amazing. Hemp crete, hemp plastic, hemp mm-hmm. rope, hemp... 
Let these farmers create these things. Let them survive. I don't want them killing themselves. I want them actually having a chance at being viable. Let them do it. But on top of that, they'll start selling it, which means it has to be stores that sell the hemp crete and the hemp this and the hemp that. So we're making stores too. It's amazing. But cannabis products too. Cannabis for people who have cerebral palsy. Cannabis for people who can't sleep. Cannabis for people who want to relax. I don't care. Whatever the case may be, you can create cannabis products. They can be you know, uh, cigarettes or they can be edibles. They can be liquids. Let, let people do what they want to do. Your point's a perfect one. I've had many, many people in New York State, across the country, but I'm, I'm focusing on the state, obviously, have chronic pain. Mm-hmm. So you have a couple of options. Option one right now, take an opioid. Yeah, 80% of all our addicts come from a prescription FDA approved drug for pain, opioid. Why would I encourage that ever? That's horrible. Or the other option is nothing, suffer. Because right now, New York State's answer is punish the doctors and put them in jail because you know what always works? Hit it with a stick. That always works. I don't like that. Hit it with a stick. That's not how it works. So now doctors are becoming afraid to actually prescribe it, which what, what does that mean? Faster to heroin, faster to meth. You've just made that pipeline even faster. So trying to make things work, you've made the pipeline to heroin faster. Mm-hmm. Wow. How bad is that? And when you realize that um, the Treasury Department, when, they, when the 21st Amendment was passed and they repealed mm-hmm. uh, prohibition, they had all these treasury agents. What do we do? Yep. That's when we started going after cannabis. Absolutely. I mean, it was yet another government program that wanted yes. to save jobs. Always. How can we save jobs? Yes. I, yes. The last option they have is what women have told me. I don't know why it's told me women. They've said, Larry, I, I hope you make marijuana legal. And I said, why? He said, because I have so much pain at night. I have to, I have to smoke it so I can go to sleep. So I have my son go and buy it. I don't want him going to jail. So the other option is being a criminal. I have an idea. How about I stop judging people for trying to get rid of their chronic pain? I said, I want happy New Yorkers. I meant that. If you have chronic pain, you can't hang out with your friends and family. You can't do things that make you happy. Who am I to tell you you can't do that? It's not my place. If cannabis gives you a better life, then have a better life. If it gives you a better farm, then have a better farm. If it gives you a better business, do a better business. And I don't want to do it like California and, and Washington and, and Colorado have done because they've done it to a point where they've taxed it so much that it's still a black market. Mm-hmm. I'm going to treat cannabis and hemp like onions with one exception, 18 years or older ID to purchase. Otherwise, it's onions because if you have chronic pain and you're poor, why is your life over? I have an idea. Grow your medicine in your backyard. Do that. Let's make happy New Yorkers. Let's make it so the little guy wins and the big guy does win. If we regulate and tax hemp and cannabis a lot, here's what I guarantee you. Big business wins, small farmers and small business loses every single time. I was at a cannabis investment summit about a month ago or so in New York City. And I, they asked me to speak because I'm the only candidate who's saying, let's do this. <laughs> Everyone else is like, no, don't do it. So they invited me to speak. There were hundreds of millions of dollars being invested. Guess how much went to New York State? Zero. Big donut, nothing. Hundreds of millions of dollars going to other states and other countries, not to my state. We could desperately use that investment and not government money, not taxpayer money, banker money that's going out any place, not going to New York State. We could create an environment of craft growth, small business, small business owners. We could do it, but we don't. Let me quickly hit on a couple of things. Second Amendment. Sure. You are, I mean, you live in Manhattan. Yep. And it is a different world. 100%. You cannot carry a gun. You are told, even if you have, like I have, private security. No, I can't even have trained private security that could carry in any place in the world. I have to hire an an NYPD cop. I have to hire somebody who is just getting ready to retire or has retired. How convenient. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about second amendment? Yeah. Uh, New York state has made the second amendment, the second suggestion. Mm. It just, it it doesn't, it's, mm, we have what's called in New York state. We have the safe act, the safe act in New York state literally made millions of New Yorkers criminals overnight. And not just criminals, violent felons. If you have any gun charge in New York State, it is a violent felony. So what they said was, oh, you know what? If you have a magazine that can fit 11 rounds in it, 
that now is illegal and evil. And so I know you bought it yesterday and it was totally illegal, but today it isn't, you're a violent felon. That happened overnight. It was horribly done. Not just that, it actually makes our medical personnel part of a secret state police. They're actually, they are actually have to report anything. So you get into a car accident and you're coming in to the emergency room and they say, uh, Mr. Beck, how do you feel? And you go, oh, I feel so bad, I wanna die. Suicidal. Yes. And now they go to your home and take your firearms. Mm -hmm. That happens, that actually happens. That's what we have right now. And the worst part is that affects veterans more than Mm non-veterans because veterans are more apt to have TBI, to have PTSD, Mm -hmm. and more apt to have firearms. Mm -hmm. And worse, we're a community. As vets, we know this. So we tell people, don't do this, don't go, you're gonna lose your firearms. So now what you have is you have one vet going to the other, he do me a favor, hold these. And when a vet goes to you and says, hold these on the vet, what he's actually telling you is, I put one of them in my mouth last night and I didn't pull the trigger. That's what he's telling you. When he gives you his firearms, he's telling you, I put one of those in my mouth last night and I didn't pull the trigger. So I had to give them to you because tonight I'm gonna pull it and they won't get help. This is what the SAFE Act does. And here's the worst part of all of these things. It creates a black market. A black market of ammunition, a black market of, of, of trading firearms back and forth without anyone knowing because they're all afraid to report. And so that, what does that do? That makes law enforcement's job even harder. Bad, bad, bad. We have something else coming out, which are red flag laws, which I think are already in California. This now makes teachers part of a secret state police. New York State's in a bad spot. I have to fix it. Sadly, that the Democrats in my state are like, great, don't stop now. Hmm. Republicans don't care. Completely apathetic, whatever, let it go. Part of the plan, whatever happens, happens. I'm saying I will get rid of the safe fact by 2020. I will make sure it gets repealed. But not just will I make sure it gets repealed. I'll make sure it gets repealed by communicating to the rest of the people how bad these laws actually are and how they're not helping anybody. They're not helping anybody. They're making people criminals. They're making people leave our state. And the world doesn't end when someone has their Second Amendment rights. I'm a big proponent of the Second Amendment, even though I don't own a firearm. Of course, I live in New York City. It'd be crazy if I owned a firearm. So I, I can't. The First Amendment is our number one amendment. And I mean that not just as number one, it's the most important. Without freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, we don't have a society, right? Without that, we got nothing. So that's the number one, that's the most important of all of them. That's why it's the first. They get that. Without that, there's no America. The second one though, that protects the first. So why do we hate it so much? Why do we hate it so much? What do I I hear all the time is school shooting or mental health. I hate when I hear that. And I hate when I hear that from Republicans more than Democrats. Democrats believe it often. Republicans, they shouldn't and they do. And when they do what they give, they give Democrats the idea, yeah, see, you can take away guns. Ask a Republican in my state about the Second Amendment. They'll go, well, you know, we've got to worry about school shootings. They have nothing to do with each other. Unhappy kids doesn't mean gun restriction, right? If you take away all the guns, the kids still want to kill. The kids are still unhappy. You haven't solved the problem. That's what you're seeing in Great Britain. Yes, knives. Yes. Knives. knives and this is what I hear all the time. Larry, you're cruel because if they have a gun, then they'll kill more people. So wait, I'm the cruel guy. I don't want them killing at all. You're okay with them killing. You just care what weapon they use. But I'm the cruel guy? No, I don't want them killing each other. Period. It's like saying you can't, have, you can't sell explosives because someone might blow up a building. Well, they couldn't buy explosives. They used a plane. Yes, absolutely. Yes. They'll find yes. a way. Yes. If that's who you are, you find a way. Yes. So let's, let's fight the root instead. And look at this. The, the kid, I think, was it Parkland? I forgot which one it was. Um, who, when he stole those guns to kill all those kids, he had already prepared pipe bombs and pressure cooker bombs in case he couldn't steal the weapons. Say it again. Pri- he p- pressure cooker bombs and pipe bombs in case he couldn't steal the weapons. So what law was gonna prevent that? He was gonna steal them. And if he couldn't steal them, he had other ways of killing. How about this kid doesn't want to kill? You wanna take care of school shootings? There's a way. In New York State, a relatively easy way. In New York State, you accept this as true. Democrats say make uh, gun-free law, law, gun free zones, right? No guns. Republicans say, put a resource officer in front of every school. That's the answer. Okay, here's the problem. All of the school shootings are planned. Resource officer, he's killed first. Right? In fact, I met a resource officer when I was uh, mm-hmm. in North Country. She's like, I, I hate my job, I'm a target. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shoot, shoot him or her first. 
Instead, very simple. If you have a license, a permit to, to, to carry a firearm in New York State and you're an administrator or a teacher and you want to, you may. That's it. Don't have to. Don't have to, you may. People say, Larry's trying to arm teachers. Nope. You don't have to get it if you don't want to. And if you can, you choose to not bring it to that school. You don't have to. But all it does is it makes the person who wants to shoot up that school go. Does he have a gun? Does he not have a gun? I don't know who's, I can no longer plan. If you can't plan, that is no longer a soft target. Now to be clear, that's a Band-Aid. Because what we see is people then choose other soft targets like churches and theaters, Mm -hmm. right? They will pick other targets. So that's a Band-Aid for school. I still have to fix the individual kid who wants to kill. So a Band-Aid's not enough. I would take that now to stop schools from being shot up. I would, but I've still got to fix the kid. How are you going to do that? As we talked about, number one is going to be education. Number two is going to be family court. Family court's a disaster in this country, heavily in New York State. It's bad. New York State's the worst. It's, it's horrible. New York State family court system is destroying families, literally tearing them apart. The amount of father's rights events I've gone to, and I look out there and I see a sea of broken men. Mm-hmm. And I say to myself, how can I fix this state with, with broken men? I can't. And the worst part is behind every one of those broken fathers is at least one broken kid, if not multiple. And the biggest thing, and I don't know how this works in other states, but in New York State, I don't know if you know this, but if you lie in family court, it is not treated as perjury. I'm sorry. Yep, I'll say it again. If you lie in family court, it is not treated as perjury. Why? I believe it comes from what used to be in New York State. New York State was one of the last states to, to have um, no-fault divorces. Mm-hmm. So for years, you're divorced, you'd have to lie to your divorce, right? You and your spouse don't get along, you can't get divorced in New York State. Right. So you're lying. Well, yeah, I cheated on her, or she slept with my best friend, right, or okay. yeah, whatever. They would lie. That was the norm. That's how you did it. That was the norm. And I believe that just kept going. Mm. I believe that that's what happened. They just kept going. And for years, that was the norm in New York State. Now New York State has no-fault divorces, but prior it didn't. So we just kept lying. So now you have a big problem here. Not just that in New York State. In New York State, we don't really have 50-50 parenting. Officially we do, but we don't. In reality, here's how it works. Woman gets custody, male gets four days a month. And people will tell me, no, Larry, that's not true. And then I say, stop lying, ask anyone. Mm-hmm. That is reality, mm-hmm. right? But not just that, because they want them to know that. Lawyers tell, literally tell their clients, you know, if you say she cheated on you, you might get the kids 50-50. I didn't say she did. I didn't say she didn't. But I'm telling you, if you tell a judge that, you might get the kids. And the other one tells the wife, you know, if you say he beat you and you're scared of him, he might, he might not be able to get the kids and you can keep him. And I said this at one of my events and it was a family lawyer, a family law lawyer actually in the room. She, said, she announces immediately, I would never do that. Just announce it right out loud when I say it. And I said, great. You tell me it doesn't happen? And literally she did this. It's her mm. exact response. Head down, look away. She couldn't answer that question. And that was, to be forward, that was on a go live. So that's on Facebook now. You can go look for that if you want to. She put her head down, looked away. Because you know it's true. Because it's not true that it's perjury, which means you're lying back and forth. The lawyers have no, have no punishment. And here's the worst part. The kids watch their mother and father lie against each other. And you wonder why our kids are thinking about suicide. You wonder why our kids don't want to have relationships. You wonder why our kids don't want to get married. They're watching their parents destroy each other. People who, their image of, of motherhood and fatherhood is right there. And they're watching it destroyed. Now, no one else talks about this. Why? Here's the reason why. It's going to sound horrible, but it's true. If you're broken through family court, you don't have any money. Mm -hmm. Your money goes either to your kids or family or to lawyers. So you can't donate. I don't make much money on this at all. (laughs) I haven't been divorced in New York State. I don't don't know how that worked. So I have no idea how that works. So I I don't have a horse in this race. But it's wrong. It's wrong. I shouldn't have every, every father's rights group I go to, everyone in that room knows someone has committed suicide, someone who's abandoned their family, and half of them have been in prison, been in jail. But they all know someone's been in jail. It's wrong. So we have to change it, but no one will talk about it. Farmers, I'm not, I'm not a farmer, but it's wrong. I don't own a firearm, but it's wrong. I don't have to have this. I don't have to be involved in this to know that it's wrong. So we have to fix it. And that's why people are saying, oh, that guy's right. Because I'm saying what's actually happening, right? When I tell people that the court system is destroying men and that doesn't sound good. It's not PC to say that. 
because it is beating up women too. It's true. There are some women who are getting beat up now also. But if you make, if you make it to where lying is treated as perjury, the person who lies when they get caught goes to jail and the lawyer who encouraged it loses their license. That protects both men and women because women often get beat up usually because of money, usually, not always, but it's often a guy is hiding money. It's a common issue, but he'll lie about it. He goes, I don't, I don't have any money. And he's got two cars, two houses. Mm-hmm. And when you find out he's got it, he'll pay something. Maybe he won't, who knows? But imagine if he went to jail and the lawyer lost his license. Well, he stops lying, right? Oh, the woman, worse. Women, women put men in jail like there's no tomorrow in New York State. I mean, because there's no due process. So literally your wife says, I'm scared of him. Boom, uh, order protection. No due process, no appeal. You got it. Now you both happen to be shopping at Walmart, you're going to jail. Happens all the time. So now here's the best part. A judge thinks that's a good idea because, you know, you're a bad guy, obviously. Why? Because she said so. Where's the due process? Nothing. And isn't, now this, you're, you're, isn't this the me too problem? It is. Got to have due process. Yes, you need due process. Have to have and due there's process. no due process. Now he goes to jail. So now his son watches his dad go off to jail. And you wonder why his son's messed up. How's his, how's his daughter going to pick a good man when her image of manhood is her father going off to jail every other week and mom going, yeah, that guy's horrible. He's a bad guy. And now they hate each other. And now they'll punish each other left and right. Why do you think they don't trust anybody? Family court system is destroying our families. And I'll go further. Now you have the second part, which is the money. It's all about the money. And it should be about the kids. It's not about the kids. It's about the money. So what does that mean? That means now, you know, John, you at one point made $100,000 a year in your life. You must now make that forever until your kid's 21. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you pay child support as if you make $100,000 forever. How is that legal? Would you have to do that if you were married? No, and in a world where jobs literally go away in five years, mm-hmm. companies pack up, mm-hmm. people, your job may no longer exist in five years. And that's what you think is right? What is wrong with you, judge? And then on top of that, till 21. So you have to pay an, an adult 18, 19, 20, 21, you have, how is that legal? Your kid's an adult. Your kid's an adult. If you want to help your kid with an adult, you should if you want to. It's your money and it's your kid. Please help if you want to. You're not required by law to help your kid when your kid's 18. Your kid's an adult. Good luck, kid. That's how that works. Not in the family court. You must. I'm still not done. You don't pay? I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll show you. I'll put you in jail. What idiot judge thought that was a good idea? Which one? Ah, oh, put him in jail. This way he loses his job and can never pay. And this way his kids see him in jail. Brilliant. Well done, judge. Or I'll take your driver's license away. How stupid is that? Or this is the worst one. I'll take away your professional license because you didn't pay. This is my state. And we wonder why things are a disaster. And the last part of this is you have a situation to where we look at family court like it is the lowest court, the lowest form. It's the kid's table. Shame on us for that. Family court's the most important court. If you have good families, you have less criminals. If you have good families, you have less people fighting each other in civil court. Family court's number one. Look at all the jails. 80% of those men, they don't have fathers in their lives. Now, this part does bother me personally because my father died when I was 12. So I didn't have a dad in my life in those years. And I ran after the Marine Corps because I was searching for positive male role models. I didn't have them. Now the state takes them away. The state, you know how many people I've heard say, Larry, I pay, you know, a thousand dollars every single month or 1300 bucks every single month. And I haven't seen my kids in seven years. Shame on a system that does that. Because here's what I know. I didn't have a father for 13 through, through 17. I would have taken a broke dad any day of the week. Any day of the week. A dad who could only give me ice cream once a month. I'd have rather had a broke dad than no dad. And the state takes dads away. And we think we're okay with that? No, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. That's a change. And no one else talks about it. I don't care where you're viewing or listening to this podcast, but uh, Larry, I've not heard uh, anything from you. And I'm sitting across the table looking you in the eye. I haven't heard anything from you that I think think you took from someone else and you just read it in their white paper. This is all really personal. Yep. Uh, and I wish you the very best. And I, I hope you make a very big impact. I hope you make an impact. I hope you win. In, of course. In New York. 
Um, Look, it's winnable but, if uh, we get support. Yeah. It's winnable. It is. This is still a winnable race. It's winnable if we get support. Because what you're feeling now is what everyone who talks to me feels. I'm just talking to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking at you. I'm not talking up here. I'm telling you what's actually happening. And when I say it, people go, yeah, he's right. That, that is what ha it's what's happening. Yes. Oh, he has a plan to repair that and to fix that. Oh, wow. He, he actually gets what's going on. We can repair this. They all, when I'm in a room and I've locked, as I said, I do two or three or four events every day. And I ask this, these four questions. How many people in this room are registered Democrats? Hands go up. How many people in this room are registered Republicans? Hands go up. How many people are registered, but not that, independent, something else? Hands go up. How many people haven't voted in the last two election cycles? Hands go up. Every single event. No one else can do that in my state. I'm the only one who can do that in my state, which means I can win. If I just get people to hear what I'm saying, they will get it. They will go, wow, I get it. And they'll vote for me. This is winnable. If I get enough support, financial support, people putting signs up, people online helping me out, all that kind of support, if we do it, we can do it. Remember, it's LarrySharp.com. Sharp with an E, and the E stands for electable. I wish you the best. Thank you. And I would uh, recommend if you uh, listen to this, uh, send it to a friend. Have them listen as well. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. 